Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Pentecost with APA Virginia staff. Thank you for joining us for our monthly webinar series, Your Hour with APA Virginia, sponsored by the Berkeley Group. Uh, we are coming in fresh off of our annual conference that happened last week in Hampton, Virginia. The theme was resilience. And we had just over 400 attendees, speakers, sponsors, award winners, and lots of other planners from around the state there. Um, it was pretty successful. It seems like everyone had a great time. And now we are looking ahead to next year's conference, which will be the 50th anniversary of the chapter and happening at the end of July in downtown Richmond at the Marriott, July 19th through the 22nd, so you can go ahead and save the date. Um, the theme is going to be World Get You Moving. It's gonna be all about the urban outdoors. So if you get tired of sitting in sessions all day, um, this conference will be a little bit different. We're gonna try to have more outside programming rather than inside. So Richmond will be a fun conference. And that is why today we have presenters from the Office of Planning, Development, and Review from the City of Richmond and talk about their master plan. Um, but before we get started, while we're waiting for everyone, I'm just going to take a couple minutes to talk about the Alexandria Symposium. That's what we have coming up next, um, happening October 20th through the 21st, and it'll be um, pretty much a half day on Sunday evening and then a full day programming on Monday at the Embassy Suites in Old Town, Alexandria. And this symposium will focus on housing affordability and partnerships. Um, there will be walking tours and lots of ways to get out and about in the town of Alexandria. So, or in Old Town, Alexandria. Um, so we, we will have more information about that coming soon on how to make a hotel reservation and how to register. So stay tuned for that. Um, we, I would normally remind you about August webinar, but I do not have a presenter yet. So if you are interested in presenting a webinar in August or in the later month, um, I'm working on scheduling those out. You can email me at Sarah with an H at apavirginia.com. The webinars are the fourth Monday of each month from noon to 1 p.m. And we strive to have a presentation that can be approved for a CM credit. So we're not super picky about the topic, but as long as it's relevant to planning and Virginia, then let's talk and get you on the calendar. Uh, let's see. And then a reminder about APA Learn. A lot of our webinars from the past are now available for a CM credit. So if you missed them or if you need some extra credits coming out of the conference, you can find our YouTube channel, APA Virginia. And in the comment section of the webinars, you can find a CM um, ID number for how to log your credit for watching it on demand. So it's different from the live webinar credit. And we will record this one today and put it on our YouTube channel so you can come back to it. Or um, if you are hearing this in the future, you can get a CM credit for it. Just look in the comment section. I uh, will send a follow-up email to all the attendees for today on how to log your CM credit and how to sign up for next month's webinar when that becomes available. Um, but for now, I am going to bring it back to this webinar. And again, the um, topic today is Richmond 300. That's the city of Richmond's master plan. And we are sort of segueing from our resilience conference into next year's conference, which will be in downtown Richmond. Um, so today we have with us Maritza Mercado Pichin. She is a project man manager at AECOM, and she's currently managing the update to Richmond's citywide master plan. Marianne Pitts is a special advisor to City of Richmond's Director of Planning and Development Review. In that role, she works on special projects for the director, such as managing the engagement process for the Richmond 300 Master Plan. And William Palmquist is Senior Planner with the City of Richmond's Department of Planning and Development Review, where he focuses on comprehensive long-range planning. Um, so I will now turn it over to them. We'll save our questions till the end. You can go ahead and type them in the questions tab as we go along. And um, in the last few minutes of the presentation, we will 
go over questions then. Um, so again, thank you, Maritza, Marianne, and William for being with us today. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Can you see our screen, Sarah? Yes. Great. So I'm Marisa Peachin. Sarah, thank you for the introductions. Um, we also, so, so that you guys can see our faces, this is the three of us. And um, I'm going to give the first part of the presentation, and then we're going to go on to Will and Marianne. So we called this equitable growth because we felt uh, in creating the City of Richmond's new master plan, we wanted to make sure that the plan reflected every person in the city of Richmond. And so we're, we're, gonna, we're breaking up this presentation into three sections. Uh, for us, planning for equitable growth and creating an equitable master plan is about process, making sure that we engage a wide section of people. It's also about communication, making sure that our information is understandable to regular folks, non-planners. Um, we definitely struggle with this from time to time because we're so used to using our jargon. Um, so Will will talk about that. And then Marianne will talk about how we're actually getting to a draft, con draft plan that reflects what people have said and how we're shaping all of that information. So planning the work. When I started at the city of Richmond, uh, working on the citywide master plan, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to plan the process. And so I, I created this document that I think is about 15 pages long um, that sketches out creating a brand, some process goals, the actual process, engagement goals and metrics, the project team, the key players that will be doing the work, and then the actual tools. Um, if you want a copy, just shoot me an email and I'll send you um, I'll send it to you so you can read the whole thing. Um, but we wanted to, I spent a lot of time planning the work and I actually sent this draft plan. I sent it to all a bunch of city staff members and then also to external people like uh, Megan Goff from VCU's planning department to get her, uh, get different people's take. Is, is this the right way to shape the process? Um, so one of our biggest process goals, I'm not going to go over all of them, is to engage 6,600 unique participants in the master plan. We got this number because we looked at Seattle and Philadelphia who had recently done plans and they had engaged about 2% of their population. This was about 2% of our population back in 2017. Um, and one of the most important words in that whole uh, sentence there is representative. Um, we like to joke that, you know, we can easily get 6,600 participants from the fan or Churchill um, some of our mo more vocal uh, neighborhoods, um, but but we wanted to make sure that we also engage people from South Richmond, North Side, the East End, just parts that typically aren't involved, um, and that's the major challenge. So we this is generally our project team. the The plan is led by the Department of Planning and Development Review because um, they're the ones who support the City Planning Commission, and the the one the the words in bold are groups that we created just for this process. So the technical team uh, was critical early on in the process and continues to be critical. That's folks, representatives from every single city department, and then also some quasi city groups like uh, the Greater Richmond Transit Company that provides our transit, and then also um, the PDC and the health district. So those are all people who um, would be engaging with the final document once it's uh, finished. And we wanted to make sure that they were involved so that the content that's in the plan is something that they would actually reference. Um, then the other ones that are external, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on those. So we started, we set up this advisory council. It's a subcommittee of planning commission. Um, we established it by resolution uh, that the city planning commission passed. And they one of the challenges when we were starting the process was who would serve on this advisory council? Should it be people who are appointed by uh, city council members? Should it be people who are appointed by planning commission? Um, should the, how, how should we should select them? Ultimately, we decided to do an open call uh, for people to apply. We had a big press covered event with over 200 people 
um, in the observation deck. We had a cake that had our logo on it. We had balloons. Um, the mayor spoke. Um, it was covered by all three major news networks. And it was just saying, hey, we're going to start the master plan and we want people to apply to serve on this advisory council. We had 153 on time applications, 25 that came in late. Originally, we were going to have 17 or 15 people in the group. We increased it to 21. Um, it's important that we have two members of our planning commission serving on it. Um, there, that way, there's a, there's a link directly to planning commission. And ultimately, I think we were really successful in creating a group that is is diverse um, and and represents our our changing city with a lot of expertise in lots of topic areas. And there's there's some folks out of that 21 who who aren't planners. They don't know that much about planning. And we wanted to make sure that we didn't have only topic experts because we wanted to have folks who um, some of the the people who are really committed to the city but don't necessarily know um, all of the zoning law and all those details. The next thing we did too is Marianne's going to talk about these, but the advisory council you had to apply to serve and you only got selected. The working groups. Um, are, are open to the public. And these are subcommittees to the Advisory Council. Um, and these were established uh, this year in March. And we had five working group topics. We created an ambassador program. So that day up on the observation deck where 200 people came, uh, we also were like, hey, we were worried that a lot of people would apply. We were worried that people would be really interested in the master plan, but then not have, if they didn't get on the Advisory Council, how could they help us? Um, and so we were like, we're going to set up this ambassador program. We're going to train people so that they can help us uh, talk about the master plan to groups that they're already a part of. Um, and we were seeing this as a way that possibly we could engage people who typically aren't engaged in planning processes. Um, it didn't it didn't really work. Uh, I think for a couple of reasons, um, we were asking folks to to come to training sessions and then go out to existing meetings that they're already a part of to talk about the master plan. And I don't think it worked because um, if, you're, if you're already civically minded, you'd, you'd be involved in this. And we're trying to reach people who aren't typically involved in civic processes. So we realized that that was not a, a program that worked with the volunteer, mainly because we're asking for volunteers. So we've sh shifted approaches. And we just um, closed this out. We we created an engagement team. And so now we had 60 people apply for these six spots. We haven't yet so, uh, announced who they are, but we specifically asked um, folks to apply to help us reach traditionally underrepresented Richmonders, which we define as members of the African-American Latino community, um, elderly, disabled, people who are low income, um, and generally people who live in the South side, East end and North side of Richmond. Um, and so what we're doing now is instead of doing the ambassadors where we're asking people to volunteer to help, um, we are paying six individuals to help us use their networks and have and, and help us reach people in their communities. Um, and so they're going to they're going to identify meetings that we can come to. They're going to go to meetings and talk about the master plan and why their community should be engaged. And they're going to also help us. Um, read read our survey that we're going to create this fall to make sure that um, make sure that it it is asking questions in an understandable way. <laughs> Basically, um, we planners like to talk in a lot of technical terms, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to uh, kind of decode what we're trying to say and make it normal. And then, so I introduced all those different groups to you so that you you could see how this process diagram works. Um, we have the first phase was defining the plan. That's where we were collecting a lot of background data. Um, Will is going to talk about this insights report right down here. Um, and then we develop, we're working right now in the developing the plan phase. We're almost done with that phase of the master of the process. Um, Marianne's going to talk about the community consultation number one these working groups, and then how we're getting ready for community consultation number two. Um, and then you'll see that at the end, we have the fourth phase, which is implement the plan. 
And I think a lot of times when planners develop processes for master plans, they kind of forget the fourth phase. They think like, oh, the plan's done, now Now we're done. We don't have to worry anymore about anything. It's like, no, 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 the plan is just a plan. You have to implement it if you wanna change um, your built environment. So I'm gonna turn it over to Will so he can talk about how we've taken um, our communications approach to be very legible and understandable so that hopefully we can get anyone to understand what it is we're talking about. Great. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Will Palmquist. I'm a planner here in the department, but I'm also kind of a maps and data guy. So I'll be talking about the communications plan and then also going through some of the background maps and uh, reports that we did in preparation for uh, community consultation number one we had last fall. So um, very first thing starting out, we wanted to create a, a brand identity. Um, we hired a local uh, marketing firm called Elevation Advertising to help us come up with the name of the master plan and also kind of the logo and how it would look and how documents would be presented. Uh, we decided on this idea of Richmond 300, a guide for growth. And the reason it's called Richmond 300 is because um, basically the city was platted in 1737, and this plan is looking at a future year of uh, 2037. So the question we've been kind of asking folks is, what do we want Richmond to be on its 300th birthday? You also have a, a website that's separate from the richmondgov.com site, richmond300.com. Um, we use that to post um, all our documents, like for the advisory council and the working groups. Other resources too, it's kind of a one-stop shop where folks can go and get information about the plan um, and also documents. So there's full uh, transparency for the public about the things that we're producing and distributing. We have a Facebook page and an Instagram page that we've been posting to get people engaged and excited about the planning process as well. And then one big um, product that we created uh, before we really started the planning process is this insights report. Uh, it's an existing conditions report that looks historically as well, um, 60 pages long, but it summarizes thousands of pages of documents, uh, GIS, map data, data, other databases as well. And um, we wrote it in a way that uh, is very graphically oriented, kind of like a magazine spread. Uh, and also we use very uh, simple language that avoided jargon so that um, anyone uh, outside of planners could, could read it and understand what we were saying and um, really the goal was to get people all on the same page so we you know there was a, a base level of knowledge for most participants in the planning process so we weren't arguing about the facts we could um, all start from the same place so i'm just going to go through some of the kind of relevant findings if you all don't have time to actually read the report um, i recommend you all check it out so richmond is growing um, we've added people for the first 20-year period since 1930 and 50 and uh, it's the first time since 1940 that we've added population without annexing land. Uh, we're also uh, changing in our, our demographics um, racially as well. We've seen an absolute decrease in the African-American population, an absolute increase in the whiter Caucasian population and Latino population since the year 2000. So we're growing, but we're actually less dense than we were in 1950, um, given the same, looking at the same area of the city as it was in 1950, uh, which might be a result of um, uh, average household size decreasing. And then looking at the existing land use, um, how the land is used today, um, one thing to think about is there's kind of a somewhat limited opportunity for for really transformative change in the land use, where if you look at um, parts of the city like single family and transportation and open space, uh, that's 57% of the city is really not gonna change fundamentally uh, in, the, in the future. So that kind of helps us narrow in on areas that, that could, could be changing or where growth could be directed. Uh, this map shows a analysis of the housing markets in the city city done by the reinvestment fund in 2017. The cooler, bluer, purpler colors are uh, better performing markets and the orange colors are poor performing markets. Um, it's kind of a way to direct growth and investment in areas and understand where markets are trending. Uh, 
an overall takeaway from, from this and other information, such as analysis done by CoStar Group, is that 18,000 more housing units are needed in the region to accommodate uh, the growth that we've been seeing. 43% um, of Richmonders spend more than 30% of their income on housing, which is pretty significant. And we have an uh, annual eviction rate that's five times the national average. This map shows walk score. Uh, basically, walk score is um, you've probably seen it before. It's kind of an analysis of um, the proximity of goods and services to certain locations. So it's not necessarily if an area is safe or nice to walk in, but how how can you accomplish your daily errands um, by foot? And you can see the core of the city, um, the historic part, and even the kind of streetcar suburban areas are relatively walkable. Um, and then the Kind of auto-oriented suburban areas are predictably not as walkable. And we're looking at how to increase walkability and also access to uh, land uses other than by a uh, single occupancy automobile. We recently redesigned the bus system. GRTC did a, uh, a route realignment for the first time since they were aligned with the old trolley lines. And while it decreased the frequency of some routes, it, it did um, triple the number of residents that were within a half mile of a bus stop. Looking at income and poverty, the uh, inflation adjusted median income uh, citywide has actually decreased over time. Um, and then poverty on, the, uh, on that map is super concentrated. So um, some parts of the city have very low poverty rates, where other parts, like the um, housing, public housing courts, have poverty rates above 70%, and about a quarter of the city's population is, uh, has incomes below the poverty line. So this is also a focus of the plan going forward as well. And then looking at um, incentives to development, so historic tax credits have been a huge boon for the city. Much of the city, um, shown in the brown color are in natural register historic districts which means properties there are eligible for uh, historic tax credits and we've seen uh, the redevelopment and reinvestment in many parts of the historic parts of the city um, really catalyzed by by that opportunity so that's been a huge uh, huge benefit for the city we also have a, a tax abatement program that allows properties to be increased in value without uh, decrease without increasing the tax bill for the first uh, so many years. Uh, that also comes at a cost where we've lost, uh, we lose $20 million of tax revenue annually by, by that program. So that's kind of the flip side to that story. And then looking at access to parks, uh, this map shows the uh, walk shed within um, a 10 minute walk of a park in the purple area. So if you live within the purple area, you are um, at least a 10 minute walk, um, if not closer to a public park. And that equ equates to about 75% of the city being within those areas. We're kind of just above Norfolk and below Pittsburgh on that chart. Um, and one of the you know, strategies, of course, is how to increase that number so everyone's within a 10 minute walk of a public park. There are a lot of environmental constraints in the city. Uh, about 36% of Richmond is impervious and half the population lives in a combined uh, sewer system, meaning that the uh, rainwater and sewage are going in the same pipes. And if there's a lot of rain, there can be overflow events into the James River. So we either need to build a bigger sewage treatment plant or we need to look at uh, mitigating the land uses and impervious surface to decrease uh, runoff and therefore the number of overflow events in the city. Now, this is an analysis done by uh, Dr. Jeremy Hoffman with the Science Museum of Virginia showing heat vulnerability. And basically what it does is takes data like um, the heat during the, the temperature during heat events, percent of impervious tree canopy, poverty rates, et cetera, to understand the, um, how vulnerable populations are to extreme heat events. And you can see um, it's correlated pretty strongly with both the most urban parts of the city that have the most impervious surface, but also poverty. So some parts are relatively, you know, not affected by high heat events for other parts of the city. The residents there are, are very affected and very vulnerable to high heat events. Uh, this map shows an analysis done by the Virginia Department of Health. It's called the Health Opportunity Index. It's based on census track and it's done across uh, the entire state. And basically, it measures the outcome of health 
um, for your entire lifetime. So the darker blues are, are where you have the highest opportunity to have a, um, a healthy life and the um, lighter colors are where it's the lowest. And one big takeaway is that 60% uh, of the population of the city of Richmond lives in areas with the lowest uh, health opportunity index score. So as we do our planning, um, thinking about how to increase that number, um, make those areas have higher opportunity for health. Looking at crime, both violent and property, uh, property crime on the right is somewhat dispersed, although concentrated in some areas, whereas violent crime on the left is uh, really very concentrated. Uh, it's directly linked to poverty, where you have neighborhoods such as those along the Lothian Turnpike and Jefferson Davis Highway, and also Gilpin Court, uh, with with very uh, very prevalent and violent crimes uh, based on 2016 data. And then public services, something that public facilities, something that we think about um, as we do the planning work. If we're making new neighborhoods, how do we add facilities to those neighborhoods to serve the population? Uh, it's relatively easy for folks to run a U-Haul and move, but then how do we adjust the public services like libraries and fire stations, et cetera, to serve those moving populations as well? And while you weren't looking, Richmond got cool. Um, Richmond's kind of seen a, a renaissance, both in terms of its exposure in the national press for its restaurants and cultural scenes. Um, I think it's really well positioned in that regard. It has a lot of cultural attributes. Uh, three, uh, one very large university, Virginia Commonwealth University, and two smaller universities, the University of Richmond and Virginia Union University. So people don't just move here because there's a house and a job they can work at. They move here because of all the cultural offerings, the food scene, uh, the historic neighborhoods, et cetera. And then this just shows kind of a question that we were using during the first community consultation based on prior population trends. If Richmond were to add 30,000 more people, where would they live? What would these areas look like? Where would they shop? Um, what other considerations would be necessary to think about? And then this chart shows uh, the historic population trends along with different major annexations of land, the last being in 1970, uh, our decrease to our, our lower point in the year 2000, and then the increase from there, and a couple uh, potential future growth scenarios, uh, whether we grow at the 2000 to 2017 rate in 20 years to 260,000, or we grow uh, at the rate we've experienced since 2010 to 300,000, or we uh, actually increase our growth rate to 340,000. And then finally, as kind of a uh, companion to the Insights Report, we did a series of maps um, on all of these different categories, I think 33 some odd different topics in total based on existing editions um, over the either today or the last five or 10 years. We did these as a paper PDF maps by council districts, the nine different council districts in the city and citywide. And we also did a online version using ArcGIS Online. So it's been a real tool for, um, for the public, even for, for city staff and our department and other departments to, to rely on. Um, it's a great interface, the online version. You can zoom around and click on things. Um, so I can just kind of check that out. You can become an expert on Richmond in, in just a couple hours. So. Now I'm going to hand it over to Mary Ann, who's going to talk about the planning process so far. Good afternoon. Mary Ann Pitts with the planning department. And um, so I'm going to be talking about how we're using the community ideas and also a lot of the data that Will talked about to shape the plan. So community consultation number one, as Maritza mentioned, we did last fall, which was our first round of public engagement. We shared the insights report. A lot of we had big boards similar to what Will just shared with you in the last section. And we asked those questions to get people to start to think about growth. So what would we have grown by 30,000 people in the last 18 years? How has that affected your life? And we received both positive and negative effects. People stating that parking and traffic and housing affordability has been affected by this, but also there are more things to do and it's a more diverse community. We asked um, where would we add 30,000 new residents and people said all over. A lot of people said south side of Richmond, but it almost seemed like they may not have known a lot about the south side of Richmond to know where people can live. We were trying to get to the um, establishing a vision for the city of Richmond in 2037 and asked that question. 
and also uh, big ideas for getting to that vision. We hosted seven visioning open houses and additionally had an online survey. And between the two, we received 1,003 responses. Um, we also staffed booths at festivals in the fall. And there's a large report if you want more information at richmond300.com. Um, in response to the vision, we had 987 different vision statements. And uh, Marisa created this word cloud that shows the largest word is city. It might not seem like a big deal, but people weren't saying that we're going to be a small town or a suburb. We are going to be a city. Um, a lot of people talked about being a diverse city with opportunities, and we are, have historic neighborhoods. Transportation and accessibility are all important things. Um, oops. Additionally, we asked people for their big ideas, and we, re we received 6,485 big ideas. And uh, we read through all those ideas, and there were in a bunch of different categories, ranging from transportation with the most and natural resources with the least. And um, surprisingly, they did, a lot of people said a lot of the same things, but um, and we are taking these to develop the plan. Uh, as I mentioned, the community consultation number one report is available online, and you can read all about where we went, who participated, and everything that we heard is summarized in this document. So from after community consultation number one, we established our working groups into five buckets, land use, transportation, economic development, housing, and environment. Each, we had a co-leader that was a representative from our advisory council, so there was always feedback going to the advisory council. Um, we had a co-leader that was a city staff member from our technical team that had expertise and connections within the city regarding the um, topic area. We had, luckily, we had a lot of PDR staff that were able to help us with this process as well. So there's one main PDR staff person and additional staff support. So a lot of the planning department has been involved in this process throughout. Each different working group had a range of from 30 to 42 members and pretty consistently attending the meetings. So it was a large group of people and the membership included technical experts who were really hoping to give us advice on the ideas that should go into the plan, in addition to interested members of the public that may just have an interest in the topic area as well. And we had a lot of working group meetings. This is the timeline that shows all the meetings that we've had from the end of March to tonight, we're having our working group summit where we're sharing everything back that the different working groups have worked on. It looks like a lot and it was scary and intimidating for all these, but it was very well organized. And I think people felt like they were able to provide input on the long list of policy ideas and also um, help us narrow down that to a shorter list of ideas. And we had, as you can see at the top, this is the land use working group. They met the most, this is the land use plan. They were tasked with coming up with the land use, the draft future land use map as well. So they met more often than the other working groups. So we have 14 meetings, five different working groups. There's all the people that were involved, 21 advisory council members, 23 technical team members, 115 at-large members, and 15 members of staff. So we had a lot of people involved in all these meetings for a total of 510 meeting visits. Um, it was a lot of work and a lot of coordination, but in a lot of people that are going to be involved in the plan that will take some ownership in the plan as well. So we, over here, we've been collecting all these big ideas from not only the community and our community consultation number one, but our technical team of city staff members and our advisory council have been providing big ideas. Um, from November 18 to April 19, we as staff were summarizing those ideas and also working with the mayor's office on establishing the vision for the master plan based on this input. And the working group was charged with vetting the topic vision and goals. Of that, as I mentioned, the land use working group worked on the land use map. In addition, the other working group viewed that document and commented as well. We developed a draft transportation map in the working group and also this long list of policy ideas. And we're taking all of this and draft form to community consultation number two, where um, will have the opportunity for additional public input. So what's included in the plan, we have a citywide vision that is going to uh, talks about what the city will be in 2037. We have for each topic area, we've created mini visions. They were originally goals, so they kind of turned into more visionary statements. So we have mini visions for each topic area, um, a range from one to five goals per topic area that will help us achieve the vision and then more concrete objectives that will help accomplish the goal. Below that, we also have some strategies that feed into the objectives um, as well. 
So here's our vision at the top. In 2037, Richmond is a welcoming, inclusive, diverse, innovative, and equitable city of thriving neighborhoods, ensuring a high quality life for all. Very visionary statement. Um, we've also decided that uh, some people don't always know what land use is or economic development, some of these terms that we are not the most um, accessible. So we've created more um, accessible chapter titles. So for land use, we have high quality places, transportation, equitable transportation, diverse economy, inclusive housing, and a thriving environment, all pulling words from the main vision statement. And below you'll see our, the visions for each different um, section, and there's more information at richmond300.com as well. So I'm just gonna briefly go through, and all of this is draft. So we haven't even brought this back to the working group summit. We haven't discussed it much with the advisory council. So you're getting a first peek at our vision and goals. Um, high quality places is our land use. As I mentioned, it's a, Richmond is a well-designed city of communities interconnected by a network of activity centers, which is a concept Maritza is gonna speak about in a moment public facilities and open space, providing services to residents, businesses, and visitors. Our first goal speaks to our idea of, of complete neighborhoods. The activity centers are crossroads where we may focus investment and um, activity. Um, our second goal is related to city facilities. We have a goal that speaks to historic preservation, a goal talking about urban design in the public realm and the walkability of the city. And another goal, it came out in a lot of the working groups that there's a need to educate people about planning and continue to educate about the master plan, also to help build uh, people that participate in civic process. So we have um, a goal related to that and several different strategies beneath that. Transportation, we're prioritizing the movement of people over the movement of vehicles through a safe, reliable, equitable, and sustainable transportation network. Um, our goal speaks to aligning land use with transportation planning, uh, making sure we have safe network of streets, um, active transportation, encouraging that through walking, biking, and transit infrastructure. We talk a lot about prioritizing areas here related to a lot of the maps that Will previously showed about low-income areas and also areas that may not have existing um, accessibility. We're building improving roadways and also um, looking at smart transportation and um, to reduce single vehicle occupancies. In regard to the economy, as we mentioned, Richmond is the home of a variety of businesses and industries that offer opportunities for quality employment and capital investment. Our first goal talks about supporting businesses and growing businesses. Our second goal, we're focusing on tourism. That came up a lot during the community consultation and the importance of tourism. And then as Will mentioned, there are several institutions and uh, universities and use leveraging those. Housing, our goal is simple. Richmond is a city where all people can access quality housing choices. Um, this one we talked a lot about, whether we have a bunch of goals or several goals, if we focus on affordable versus market rate, we came up with one goal and um, ensuring the preservation of mixed income communities. Uh, this includes providing for affordable housing units, whether it's keeping the existing or developing new ones. The environment, um, our Vision is Richmond is a sustainable and resilient city with healthy air, water, and a flourishing ecosystem. And our goals relate to those. Um, our first goal is related to a resilient community. We um, are next is air quality and then water quality. And um, a lot of these also relate back to the maps. A lot of the prioritization deals with the um, the heat vulnerability map as well. So for community consultation number two, we are have our digital input through the website. We're continuing to advertise through our social media and email newsletters, and we're creating this survey that people can access online as well in paper. We recognize that um, not everybody has access to these digital tools, so we have a lot of non-digital um, ways to attempt to engage with people. We'll have town halls again. Because they were somewhat successful in some areas, we'll be having press releases, uh, flyers and posters that our engagement team is going to help distribute we're going to be attending existing meetings that are already occurring in the community. We're going to be in neighborhoods as with planner office hours. And there's um, two programs that we're participating in that actually, Marisa, do you want to describe those better than? Yeah, so one of the cool things about having started the master plan, we did a lot of process and did a lot of like talking to all sorts of people before we did community consultation number one. That meant that a lot of folks 
were aware, started to get aware of this and we were able to get into their calendars. So the Valentine History Museum does an annual program from November to February every year where, that's called the Controversial History. Um, and they are, it's five, five meetings that they do and we happen to have five working group topics. And so they have asked to use our five working group topics and they're gonna build their whole series um, on our plan, which is which is just awesome because it means that we're just helping provide the content and they're they're doing all of the production and promotion. And then related to that, so one week they're going to be focusing on uh, the high quality places, and then two weeks after that that series, um, after that lecture, there will be a world cafe style thing at a place called Gallery Five in Richmond, um, where people can where there'll be different nonprofits and different folks at tables uh, so that folks who attended the controversial history series at the Valentine can then um, learn more about how to get more involved at Gallery 5 two weeks later. Great. Thank you. That's interesting. So we, this is hot off the presses and um, Marianne went over all of the, the policies, you know, the visions, the goals, um, then there's strategy objectives and strategies under that, and that's all text content that goes into the plan. But as, as you all know, um, there's a lot of maps that go into the plan as well. Um, and this is kind of hot off the presses. Um, we're going to be sharing some of we're sharing this tonight at the working group summit. Um, so we have this concept of activity centers, um, otherwise known as nodes in planner speak. But the word node isn't necessarily something that is super accessible to most people. So we've been kind of playing back and forth on what do we call them. Um, and the idea is, um, how do we focus our efforts? As Will said, you know, lots of the city isn't gonna change over the next 20 years. So let's focus our efforts on places that are and trying to make better places. And so we're looking at major crossroads. We're trying to figure out, you know, how, how is each one unique from another? How can we focus in the urban realm uh, section of the plan, how can we direct public art money to go to these these places to create better uh, a sense of place? Um, and then how can we focus our efforts of co connecting the different communities with transportation at, to connect these networks together? Um, so I am gonna pull up, I was going to pull up, there we go. I'm gonna pull up how this all comes together. Whoops. Um, so we have, this is our city and on the left, you'll see there's f four different kinds of activity centers. There's downtown, um, and downtown is here and it's purple because it's an established activity center. So that means that, uh, it has low vacancy, um, and that generally it will be like it is today with some help, but generally, you know, it, it'll be fine in the next 20 years. That doesn't mean it doesn't need any anything in the master plan dedicated to it, but it's established. Um, and then we have regional centers. So those are shown here um, and the various colors. So established, those are the purple. Those are ones like Carytown, VCU. Um, and then emerging is like Manchester, Greater Scotts Edition, um, uh, not established. So like Southside Plaza, we see as an opportunity, it was, you know, its heyday was in, I think, the early 60s when it opened as one of the first commercial strip developments in Richmond. And so we're we're trying to figure out, you know, how can we uh, make it, it, it is today a, a major crossroads. There's a lot of buses that uh, transfer there. And how, how can we improve the the place of Southside Plaza through creative placemaking, through better, better uh, pedestrian and bike connectivity? Um, to the rest of the neighborhood. Um, and then you'll see some of the the blue ones. So like Chippenham, Midlothian, right over on the other side in Chesterfield, this is a major development area for them. So we're trying to see how can we connect with that growth. Um, Stony Point Fashion Park is one of, is our big mall. Um, and, you know, mall malls are changing. And so we want to make sure that what we have in the plan um, supports the the continue the evolution of Stony Point Fashion Park as it as it needs to evolve in a changing uh, retail marketplace, and then we have neighborhood centers. These are coming up really light on the map. I'm sorry about that, but I'll basically people the neighborhood centers are crossroads where um, most people who are going there are coming from zero to two miles, 
they're, you know, they might be walking or biking. And so we have those highlighted. And then we created something which we didn't have earlier, which is a micro center. And the micro center are like tiny, like crossroads. So if you think of the fan, the fan is a really cool place and it, it has a lot of different little centers. And I think that's probably what makes the fan such a wonderful part of Richmond. Um, but none of them are like necessarily the same level as Carytown. Um, so when you put them all together on the map, you can see how they all uh, make a plate, make lots of different places within our city. And so then we were asking ourselves, how are people going to get there? So this is the bus network um, today, the purple lines, and you see the activity centers are now in gray, right? They're kind of in the background. Um, and we're saying these routes that are already 15, these are already our 15 minute, some of them are 30 minute routes in Richmond, and we're saying that um, we want them to be enhanced. So that might not, that might mean BRT, that might mean um, a dedicated lane, but not necessarily BRT, or it could just mean more frequency or later hours. Um, so we're trying to, we're trying to, some of these places, uh, we're trying to make kind of pre-TOD. So like, how do we, if we do another BRT line, how do we make sure that some of the places in Southside um, are developed to an intensity that would support more transit. Um, then we have our existing bike. So that's in, that's in yellow. Our, these are bike facilities. We're only showing dedicated bike lanes. We're not including Sharrows as an existing bike facility. And then in orange, you can see proposed. This is, um, the city did a bike master plan. And so a lot of these uh, routes are from the bike master plan. Some of them got realigned after we did the Pulse Corridor Plan, which is an amendment to the master plan that we passed when we, the city developed the BRT. And then we think it's important, so these are shared use paths. We think it's important to start to build out a network of ways that people can uh, get around the city uh, not on roads and have dedicated shared use path system um, along, especially along our riverfront, on both sides of the riverfront, where this is a proposal here uh, on the south side, on the north side of, of the James to potentially rewater the Kanawa Canal um, and create a shared use path along it. We uh, very recently, the city just developed a draft James River Park master plan. Um, and I know that that draft master plan has some more shared use paths that aren't shown here. So we'll just Part of, the, part of the working group summit this evening is for us to make sure that we're showing everything that everyone else has been working on in the city. Then we have this map shows kind of this, the street network and bridges and interchanges. So um, where we want to just create a better gridded, a better connected city. Um, so you'll see where, where there's this grid on top. These are areas that we think should have street grids introduced. Uh, where possible. I mean, it's not always city-owned land, but as as plan of developments or com, uh, come through and special use permits, you know, the, the city staff members can say, hey, we want, we don't want you to create cul-de-sacs or we want to make sure that you, you integrate with the rest of the street network. That's important because if we want the enhanced transit to work, we have to have um, a good street network. Um, that also helps with the walk score that Will showed earlier. Um, there's improved interchanges. So some of these interchanges are ones that have, they've been talking about at the PDC um, that needed to be improved. And then we also have bridge connections. So um, this is a, this is a bridge that exists that needs to be uh, made better for bike and pedest bike and buses. Um, and then there's some proposed new bridges to come in, especially down here at the downtown expressway where uh, we're talking about capping the highway, um, Kanawa Canal, and uh, I think it's the Williams Mullen building downtown are both actually on top of the downtown expressway, and we'd like to see more of that. And then up here where Gilpin Court is, um, it's very, Gilpin Court is the oldest public housing project in the city. Uh, it's very much uh, bifurcated from the rest of the city, and so we would like to see better pedestrian and bike and, and automobile connections across. There's only one bridge that goes across now. Um, and then 
another concept related to connections are these great streets. So in blue here, in the kind of aquamarine blue, these are these are wonderful boulevard streets that exist in our city today, but there's places where there are gaps. And so we're like, hey, it's it's Southside Plaza redeveloped into something else. If Greater Scott's Edition redeveloped into something else, we'd want to see the, that uh, urban realm continued, uh, creating a, a wonderful street network. So in the dark blue, you can see places where we would want to have just um, this great street streets concept uh, incorporated into into the right of way design. Um, so this is all of it together, which looks crazy, um, but it but it shows how when you, when you start you if you if you can barely see the activity centers, you can see that they're activity centers because there's a lot of transportation um, that's happening in the background to make them work. And then I'm just going to go over it really fast because I know because everyone's a planner here. Um, so over time when the city adopted several plans um, everyone was using a different legend so the future land use map the current adopted future land use map that the city has has 31 different categories and so in in a nod to trying to make things more accessible to everyone we're proposing 10 categories um, so that so that it's easier for staff to use and even easier for for community to use as well so the the ten, um, the ten end up sh looking like this, and there is, and on our website on richmond300.com/slash/working-groups, you can see all of these. Um, so there's downtown. Um, so for each future land use category, we have a, we have different a, a grid. A matrix that explains what would be accepted in each in each one what we're, we're envisioning there's nodal mixed use which is basically downtown outside of downtown so buildings that aren't quite as tall as downtown but it's still significant places uh, where we would want to see a little bit more uh, intensity of uses there's corridor mixed use which is not necessarily mixed use within one building so not vertical mixed use but horizontally where there might be um, several buildings next to each other that are different uses. And with corridor mixed category, we're trying to uh, make sure that buildings are built to the street, that it's a walkable urban environment so that those activity centers that I showed before are connected um, by corridors that are places that people would wanna walk um, or bike and not, not always be in a single use car. There's neighborhood mixed use, and this speaks to our historic urban neighborhoods that have a lot of housing. Um, they're pre predominantly residential, but they also have commercial at the corners. Um, so in our current future land use map that the city currently has adopted, um, the Fan, Church Hill, Oregon Hill, of Jackson Ward, Carver, they're all, they all have different future land use categories. Um, and so what we're trying to say here is that those are all very similar and we wanna make sure that the, the, the way that they are, the way that they are stays because we think they're wonderful places and then we want to make we want to encourage other places to develop the same way in that future on uh, that neighborhood mixed use way we have industrial we have this industrial mixed use category which is what scott's edition is um, and those are areas where there is uh, now more residential uses wanting to come into the areas uh, alongside kind of my you know small production uh, institutional open space, low density residential, and then medium density residential. Medium density residential is essentially the streetcar suburbs, and low density is essentially the, the post-war suburbs and a large lot, uh, like, what are those called? Estate homes, yeah. So in Windsor Farms, where we have huge estate homes. So that's what our future land use map looks like. And then, I am going to leave it five minutes left. Perfect for some questions. Uh, our next steps are that community consultation number two, where we'll get input, like Marianne said, on on the goals and vision that she talked about, um, and also on the maps. Then we're going to write the actual document, and then in March we'll bring the document PDF to the community, and then introduce it to council. So, 
yeah, if anyone has questions, we'd be happy to, to answer them. Okay, this is Sarah. Thank you. Right, so Will and Marianne, we do have some questions coming in. Um, before we get started on those, um, I've been asked a few times if that concept planning document, if you uh, can share that with me and I can send it out with the follow-up email. Is that okay? The, the planning, the process plan? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. okay. Um, cool. So that way you don't have to field a bunch of emails asking for it. I will send that out with the follow-up email. Um, okay. So let's get started. The first question is how and by whom was the walk score map prepared? Um, so the walk score, it's proprietary data. It's a national company. You can go to walkscore.com and type in an address and view the, view the walk score uh, for, for a certain area. So we purchased it uh, in 2016 data and um, it technically was kind of difficult to make it work, but we, it's, it's grids and we basically just use what they gave us. Um, and there's, there's underlying information with it too. So if you buy it and you get the index, there's also all the, all the stuff that goes into how it was calculated based on the different measures they use. Okay. Um, next question is, can we get information about the RVA tax abatement program? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's on the, yeah, it's on the finance website. Um, so we'll send, Sarah, we'll send you an, a link to it. Okay. Um, but basically it's, uh, if you improve the value of your home by 40%, um, you can abate the increased value for 10 years and you abate it fully for seven years and then it rolls off for the last three. Okay, um, next question. How much money did this process cost, including the effort of government staff? Don't know. And that's a that's good question. question. <laughs> All righty. Um, next question is, is the school system included in the master plan? And if so, how is it incorporated? So the school system is, is in the master plan. Um, we have a, we have a member, we have a couple people from the, on the technical team or from the school system. Um, the schools is currently doing a rezoning of of their schools, and so one of the recommendations that we actually have in the plan is to um, is to rezone it again, <laughs> probably, you know, to like reevaluate how how the future land use will impact um, school zones. Um. The next two questions, I'm going to try and mesh it into one question because they're kind of similar, but asks, what are plans for greening the heat island areas like Scott's Addition, and how will surface lot redevelopments in Monroe Ward be expected to prioritize public green space or green infrastructure that addresses the urban heat island effect? Let me know if you want me to repeat any of that. Um, so for Monroe Ward, which was just recently rezoned um, from a kind of less urban land use uh, type of zoning to uh, one that fosters a more urban environment, there is also a uh, plan of development review overlay uh, ascribed to it as well that has a number of uh, criteria that um, includes like the public realm and, and kind of trees and screening and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'd say as projects redevelop, um, by right within the zoning, the POD process will, um, which is which is strengthened more uh, strongly than it was prior, uh, will have the ability to uh, have these projects add green space and, and streetscape elements and that kind of thing and, and more trees. So that's one way through the redevelopment process. We, uh, the private uh, sector can, can do that. Uh, similar to Scott's addition, um, Difficult because there's not a lot of publicly owned land there, and the land values have have skyrocketed in recent years. So the opportunity for you know like a real seminal kind of public open space might not be there. So we have to think more creatively about leveraging private development um, in that regard as well. So I think maybe similar tools can be deployed deployed there. 
In Scott's addition, they're also building a, a, a shared use path around the perimeter. Um, and it's not directly within Scott's addition, but the Science Museum just right next to it is about to build an, I think an eight acre park in front. Um, another thing that we've been talking about is how variation in building height can actually help reduce the heat island effect because it, it encourages uh, air circulation. And so hopefully as Scott's addition redevelops, um, you'll get a little bit more variation. Part of the reason why it's so hot there is not just because it's all impervious, or, but also because it's all the same height. Uh, next question, why was weather pattern not considered and do you have a backup plan if this doesn't work or if some crisis takes place in between? Why was weather pattern? I, I, I assume the question is asking about climate change. Um, and we did, uh, in the insights report, uh, there's a section on sustainability and resiliency and we asked the Dr. Jeremy Hoffman with the Science Museum, who's a climate scientist, to write a white paper for us uh, describing what the impacts of climate change would be on Richmond. And he, and so we cited his paper in the Insights Report because uh, there wasn't anything like it before, so that's why we asked him to do it. Um, and the two big things that will impact Richmond are uh, extreme heat, so longer days, more days that are very hot, and the second one is more precipitation, so more frequent, more intense rainfall events. So we are, um, are the, the Marianne discussed the thriving city, the thriving environment section. And one of the goals under thriving environment is about resilient communities to help address the impacts of those two major climate events. We've been working very closely with our Office of Sustainability, who's helped a lot with the objectives and strategies under that section. So we have a lot of strategies to um, attempt to mm -hmm. address that, achieve that goal. Yeah, all of the words that Marianne shared of all of the different goals and visions for the five different areas have been worked over with a lot of city staff uh, input from the, from the departments that are most impacted by those sections. Well, I think that those were some great answers to some great questions. Um, I, unless someone wants to put one more in there, I don't have any more questions at this time. Um, so I just want to remind everyone, I'll send that follow-up email with the documents and with how to get in touch with the presenters if you want to contact them directly. Um, um, Maritza, William, and Marianne, do you have anything else you want to add before we wrap things up? No, just come visit Richmond. It's really cool. <laughs> I'm in Richmond, I can confirm. <laughs> Alrighty, well, thank you all for spending your lunch hour with us and stay tuned for next month's webinar. We hope to announce that in the next week or so. And I hope you have a great rest of your Monday.